Hey guys, happy day after Halloween, and I swear to God if I see so much as a sprig of holly or any semblance of a wreath before Thanksgiving, you are dead to me. Do you hear me? Dead. Hey guys, welcome back to The Stimulus. I'm Steph Evs, and here's what happened this week in STEM. Our first story of the week deals with a brand new piece of medical technology. A team led by researchers from the University of Illinois have developed a flexible patch that can be worn on the skin in order to monitor blood flow. This type of technology can be incredibly important because certain diseases such as diabetes or kidney disease can limit blood flow to certain parts of the body, which can cause permanent damage, and in its early stages can be incredibly difficult to detect. Today, optical or auditory methods such as ultrasound are typically used to detect this problem, but they have their limitations. For example, many technologies that use these methods require the patient to remain completely still, so it has to be conducted in a lab environment. Additionally, many of the devices used for these methods are very bulky and cumbersome, limiting the patient's mobility even if the patient is allowed to move. Depending on how these devices are attached to the patient, they can cause extreme discomfort and over time have proven to provide inaccurate measurements. This new device was tested on several patients in a lab and was found to be just as accurate as its more bulky counterparts. This new tech uses thermal methods to detect blood flow rather than the auditory or optical methods typically used. This makes the instrument less susceptible to motion. This new device consists of a 100 nanometer thick array of metallic wires oriented around a central sensor that is then coated with silicone to make it more flexible. The device is able to stick to your skin, a lot like a temporary tattoo, but if it's not Star Wars or doesn't have glitter, I am not about it. I am very particular when it comes to my temporary tattoos. The patch is capable of mapping blood flow in addition to detecting slight temperature increases caused by each pulse of blood. Currently, the device has to be connected to a computer via a thin wire, but the hope is to eventually integrate Bluetooth in so that it can be wireless. Bluetooth, of course Bluetooth. I don't mind Bluetooth as long as you're not wearing it in your ear and I know when you're talking to me so I'm not carrying on this awkward conversation with you while you got your little thing in your ear and then you look at me like I'm the moron. No, you were talking to nobody and I just thought I was trying to be polite and engage you in conversation. My bad for being social. I apologize for nothing. <sighs> stupid Bluetooth. If the device can go wireless, this opens up the realm of possibilities of implanting it directly onto internal organs in order to monitor blood flow through them and diagnose certain medical conditions. These devices are easy to manufacture and are very cheap, so if they do enter the clinical world, they could be game-changing. Our next story of the week takes us to China, where they are trying to smash particles harder than the Incredible Hulk smashes puny gods with bad attitudes. On Thursday, China announced plans to build a particle collider two times as large as CERN's Large Hadron Collider starting in 2020. The LHC is located in Switzerland and consists of a circular track over 16 miles long. It's capable of smashing electrons together at 13 tera electron volts of energy. To put this in perspective, one tera electron volt of energy is about equivalent to the energy expended by a flying mosquito. While that may not sound like a lot, consider the scale on which this is happening. That much energy is getting jammed into a space one million million times smaller than the pesky mosquito. That's pretty dense. The Chinese Collider is anticipated to generate seven times more energy than the LHC and is expected to produce millions of Higgs boson particles. In comparison, the LHC only generated 1.2 million Higgs boson particles during its operation from 2011 to 2012. However, CERN isn't taking this news lying down. In fact, they've recently announced plans to upgrade the luminosity of the LHC by 2025. This upgrade would allow them to smash particles together at 100 tera electron volts and would make them capable of producing 15 million Higgs boson particles per year. So while the particle smashing in the first place, well, researchers are looking for something called the God particle. This God particle is considered to be the fundamental building block of the universe. It'll be interesting to see how this all plays out. Science isn't a contact sport, well, generally, but when it gets competitive, everybody wins. Our next story of the week deals with a revolutionary new treatment for late stage melanoma on the skin and lymph nodes that the FDA approved this week. This treatment will utilize the herpes virus. Wait, like herpes? Herpes? Or herpes? Herpes? Okay. Now before everybody freaks out, this virus right here, which I am not even going to try to pronounce, also known as TVEC, which is what I will use, has been drastically altered to reduce its ability to cause herpes. Phew. <laughs> Researchers have also inserted a gene encoding protein that stimulates the immune system. Wait a minute, don't viruses make you sick? Well, they can, but as far back as the 1800s, scientists noticed that sometimes viruses could cause tumors to grow or shrink, but they really weren't sure why. 
In the 1950s and 1960s, sometimes scientists would inject cancer patients with a cocktail of viruses in order to see if it would help. Sometimes it did, and sometimes it didn't and the people died. Eh. In recent years, scientists have been able to advance virology treatment significantly. They can now alter certain viruses so that they will infect and kill cancerous cells while not harming nearby healthy ones. Another advantage to using viruses is that they trigger an immune response, something cancer cells don't really do. When you combine these two factors, you get a cancer treatment effective at treating late-stage cancers, which are typically resistant to drugs. Before its approval, this drug was tested on over 400 patients with metastatic melanoma, a type of cancer which kills over 10,000 people in the United States each year. All of the patients had lesions caused by the cancer on their skin and lymph nodes. When the drug was directly injected into the infected site, 16% saw their lesions shrink over a six-month period. While this may not sound like a lot, it's important to remember that every step forward in the fight against cancer is significant, no matter how small. Scientists are hoping that they can continue to develop virology treatments so that they don't necessarily have to be directly injected onto the cancer site. The hope is that eventually they could be delivered via the bloodstream without triggering a premature immune response. Scientists are also hoping that this latest drug approval will open the door for more virology treatments in the near future. Our final story of the week takes us to Saturn's moon Enceladus, where the Cassini spacecraft made its closest pass ever this week at a distance of only 30 miles. So why are we sending Cassini to buzz the moon? Well, scientists wanted to take a closer look at the geysers erupting from Enceladus' surface. These cryovolcanic plumes, named such because they spew water, ammonia, and methane rather than the molten rock that we see here on Earth, can spew particulates as high as 125 miles above Enceladus' surface. The hope is that by sending Cassini buzzing through these plumes at the lower altitudes, we'll be able to learn more about the ocean hidden beneath Enceladus' surface, which as you may recall, I talked about in this Twistum episode right here. Click the annotation to go check that out. The thought is that by sending Cassini flying through the plumes at lower altitudes, we'll be able to detect more complex, heavier compounds. These compounds could prove most helpful in determining if the ocean is capable of supporting life. Cassini was also keeping an eye out for hydrogen during its flyby. The presence of hydrogen could indicate whether the ocean floor is active and infusing life-sustaining energy into the ocean. Now we won't know what Cassini found for another couple weeks as researchers are currently sifting through the data, but we did get back some pretty cool images. Cassini's next close flyby is scheduled for December 19th at a distance of over 3,100 miles. This time, Cassini will be trying to determine the amount of heat that Enceladus' core is emitting. So that brings us to our question of the day, guys. Enceladus is just one of many possible places where life could exist in our solar system. Where do you think we should be looking? Let us know in the comments section down below. As always, if you want to check out any of the stories I covered a little bit more in depth, I will include links to those down in the description, along with links to all of my social media, so check that out in your free time. If you like this video and you want to see more sciencey stuff just like this, feel free to give it a big thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. I'm putting out videos every week to talk about the latest and greatest in STEM news. And t-shirt sales are over, guys. They are kaput. Done. The design is no more, but I want to say thank you guys to everybody that bought one. I am so, so, so incredibly appreciative. And when you start getting your shirts, put them on and send me your Stemula selfie and tell me what stemulizes you. Haha, -ha, puns, they're great. Also, keep an eye out for any really cool STEM-related news stories throughout the week. And if you find some that pique your interest, send them my way on Twitter at at 43 using the hashtag twist them, and they just might wind up in next week's episode. But as always, I hope you guys have a wonderful week. Stay well, stay awesome, and I will see you next time. so bad right now I just ah now that the microphone is actually clipped to my shirt and not just dangling in between my boobs let's see how this goes ah incredibly difficult to detect in its early stages I should probably breathe at some point in that sentence <laughs> watch Steph pass out on camera because she refuses to take a breath it's gonna be great but they have limitations for these particular methods, it's very bulky and com- I think I made a fart noise with my mouth. We're doing great today! Even though blah blah be inaccurate. Close enough. Uh, oriented. A particle collider. Particle collider. It's not hard, but for some reason I can't say it. Ah! On Thursday, China announced announced, I don't know why it was Southern or Australian. We're not sure which, but equally offensive, I'm certain. <laughs> that was not a good sentence. Take a drink. Not vodka, but I kind of wish it was. The LHC is located in Switzerland, eh? Switzerland. 
God, my Midwest is showing. <laughs> One tera electron volt is the. She's beauty, aren't she? She's grace. She's about to fall on her face. Nailed it. <laughs>